introduce some basic things and the power and limitations of genomite association studies. And then, so you can explore this topic a little bit on yourself with your own data, I want to uh, go through a demo on a simulation script that I wrote for this workshop. And you know, hopefully you can use that yourself. I'm not gonna, we're not going to take the time to type that out this time. Uh, we'll just, I'll just go through it in class. And then it's available in the GWAS examples folder on that Atmosphere instance. So you can download it and use it yourself. Just to remind you, remember we have two ways to map QTL, or at least two ways, I should say. Uh, linkage mapping and association mapping. And each have their, their pros and their cons. So with linkage mapping, we're using a biparental population. We're only looking at two alleles per locus. Uh, we have to develop the mapping population. It takes a long time. Uh, but the advantage is that we don't have any family or population structure. Okay? That can confound results. Now with association mapping, we have, you know, if we're using the diversity contained within our species or our land race or our breeding population or what have you, we're looking at hopefully all the alleles segregating in that population. Uh, and we can use any collection of lines that are already exist. So we can genotype, phenotype, and maybe get good results by, you know, next year. But the, the problem is, is that we oftentimes have severe population structure that we have to account for. And we have to account for it so we don't get spurious associations. But as I'll show you, accounting for it can actually reduce your power of detec detection in some situations. When I talk about power and false discovery rate, this is what I'm talking about. So your false discovery rate is the number of times you reject a null hypothesis and in fact the null hypothesis was true. Okay? So how many times you were wrong? Your power, on the other hand, is the, number, the, 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 the proportion of times that you reject the null hypothesis when in fact the null hypothesis is false. So if the null hypothesis is really false, if there in fact is a QTL present and you do uh, you, the, the power is, you know, what's, what's the probability that you actually reject that null hypothesis correctly? Okay? And there's a trade-off between power and false discovery rate. The lower you set your statistical threshold, the more power you have, but at the same time, you're going to have a higher false discovery rate. Okay? So you want to sort of strike that balance, and you want to maximize your power while, you know, minimizing your false discovery rates as best you can. Okay, some drawbacks now on... Um, genome-wide association studies. If you don't have adequate marker density, you're going to have low power. This is one advantage of linkage mapping is that since you've, through hybridization, you've created a lot of linkage, you don't need that many markers to ensure that you have at least one marker in good LD with the QTL. So you have really good power. You have low resolution, but you have good power. In GWAS, is, the LD decays very rapidly, so there's a good chance you're not going to have a marker in LD with a QTL, and the power to detect a QTL is a function of the amount of variation that QTL explains and the LD between your marker and that QTL. The amount of variation that your marker explains in a population is a direct product of the amount of variation uh, explained by the underlying QTL and the LD between the marker and the QTL. Okay? So you could have the biggest QTL in the world, but if you don't have a marker in LD with that QTL, you're not going to find it. Uh, the other way around, you could have a very, very, very small effect QTL, and you could have a marker right on top of that QTL, but you're still not going to find it because it has a small effect. And you can see that in this results from the simulation that I run. Uh, we have different QTL here that were simulated that explain a certain proportion of the genetic variation, either 3%, 5%, or 12%. And this graph, graph here, what it has is the power plotted against false discovery rate. So we can increase the power by lowering our statistical threshold, but as we do that, we're going to increase the false discovery rate. And so what we want is we want, we want this line to be as close to the y-axis up here as possible. So you can see that for large effect QTL, ones that explain 12% of the very genetic variation, uh, at very low false discovery rates, we still have good power to detect that QTL. On the other hand, for very, very small effect QTL, in this situation anyway, we had to dramatically or increase the false discovery rate to unacceptable levels, I would say, to have any 
power at all to bind that QTL. Okay. Another drawback of GWAS is the difficulty in finding alleles that have low minor allele frequency. In a biparental linkage mapping population, all the alleles have a frequency of 0.5. Okay. So you see it half of the time. You have great power to detect those, those alleles. Uh, in a genome-wide association mapping panel, for example, you don't have this luxury. You have a lot of alleles that might have a very low frequency. Sometimes they have a frequency less than 1% actually, but they still are important to alleles controlling variation for your trait. This, from this uh, paper here, I took this figure, and this was actually the minor loop frequency of the SNPs used to genotype a diversity panel in maize. You, you can see that most of the SNPs in this diversity panel have minor loop frequencies that are less than 0.1. Okay? So most of the alleles in there have low minor loop frequency. And you can see from the simulation, they showed that for different effect sizes, so you, you can vary the effect size in the simulation, and you can also vary the minor loop frequency. You can see that both effect size and minor loop frequency influence your power to detect those QTL. You could have uh, a very, very large effect, or not a very, very large effect, but I would say a large effect QTL, but if you have a low minor loop frequency, you have rather limited power to detect it. Okay, you don't see that allele very often, and therefore, in this low minor loop frequency means that it explains a small proportion of the variation, so it's tough to detect. Okay, so population structure. So this is a little bit more complicated topic here. <coughs> Now, I said we had to c correct for population structure to avoid spurious associations, but it is possible that we could have alleles that have different frequencies between our subpopulations, but there really are alleles that are controlling our quantitative trait. And when we add these population structure terms to the linear model, we basically remove variation coming from these alleles, and it really reduces our power to detect them. Uh, so this is a recent paper in genetics, just within the last couple of months, I believe. They took a few different diversity panels in maize, and at each individual locus, or at each individual SNP, they looked at the minor loop frequency of that locus, and they looked at the FST at that locus, or at that SNP across the different populations. And the FST, for those of you that don't know, is just a, a measure of how divergent the population is, basically a measure of how different the subpopulations are for allele frequencies at this locus. Okay. So as the FST increases, the more different the subpopulations are in allele frequency at this locus. You can see that as FST increases, your power is reduced. So power is represented by the colors here, with the cool colors being low power and the warmer colors being high power. So when the FST or the allele frequency differences between the subpopulations uh, are always quite different, meaning the FST is high, uh, we always have fairly low power. It's not until we have high minor loop frequency and low FST that we have good statistical power to detect our QTL. Again, this is a result of, of uh, the correction for the subpopulation structure effect in the model, okay? For alleles that actually are actually different between the subpopulations, this reduces our power to detect them. Another problem is, is that because in a lot of association mapping panels, we have rapid LD decay. We need lots and lots of markers, okay, for the reasons I explained before. We need them in high LD with our QTL. But this results in massive multiple testing problems. And to ensure that we have a good experiment-wise error rate, okay, we don't get too many false positives across all of our tests, we need to set the pretty stringent statistical threshold. And once you set this stringent statistical threshold, it's, just, it's, I mean, it's quite frankly quite difficult to, to declare any significant QTL. You might have real QTL in these regions, okay? but they just don't quite make it above that, that statistical threshold. So you're probably not going to uh, want to do anything with them. A lot of these things, who's heard of the missing heritability? about half the room or so, or two-thirds of the room. I think most, most people, anyway. This, these sort of things result in what has been called the missing heritability 
this isn't anything new. I mean, this, this article, this original article here with that wonderful animation, it was published about six years ago. Okay. So this, the, what this is, missing heritability, what this has to do with is the fact that, uh, you know, despite all these massive genomite association studies in humans and other species as well that involved tens of thousands of individuals and hundreds of thousands of markers, they've only been to able to explain a small proportion of the genetic variation for complex traits like height. Okay. They detected 40 QTL through all these GWAS studies, and, but, but they're only able to explain about 5% of the variation. So the question is where is the rest of the genetic variation? How come we're not detecting it using GWAS methods? And the answer to that is you know, a combination of these different factors that I just presented to you. Low minor allele frequency, maybe a lot of the variation for quantitative traits is generated by alleles that have very low minor allele frequency. Okay? It's very difficult to detect those. This is just a graphic illustrating those okay, from this paper. So again, rare variant, small effect, hard to detect. Maybe this, these are the types of variants that control the variation for a trait like height in humans. Common variants, large effect, those are easy to get. But how common are they? Um, not clear, maybe not so common for something like height. And I didn't include it, but there's, there have been some more recent studies, for example, in, I think it was 2010, Peter Vischer, uh, a quantitative geneticist in Australia and colleagues looked at more of a genomic selection approach to, look, or to trying to explain the genetic variation in height. And what they did is they basically removed this very statistical, high, highly stringent statistical threshold okay, that they would need to declare a QTL and they took more of a ge or genomic prediction approach and they modeled all the variants out there, and they showed that you can explain about 50% of the genetic variation in height once you, you take that different approach. And rather than declare QTL being significant or not significant, uh, you just model all the SNPs. So, and others have looked at the role of interactions in explaining this missing heritability, um, and others have looked at the role of low frequency variants or very rare alleles in explaining this missing heritability. So, it's surely not just one thing, it's surely all these things I just talked about. And these are some of these references if you want to, to read more about this. <laughs>